Okay, so um, our next talk is about uh, masking technique in the context of uh, trickable uh, block ciphers with application to authenticated encryption. So uh, this is a joint work by Robert Granger, Philip uh, Joanovic, exactly. Bart <laughs> Manning, <laughs> and Samuel Neves, and uh, Philip will be giving the talk. Exactly. So thanks for the introduction, and hello, everyone. Um, so let me start uh, with uh, some terminology. Um, so we all know what, uh, what a block cipher is. It takes uh, a message and the secret key as input and then applies some uh, nonlinear operations on it and you get a cipher text as an output. Um, a tweakable block cipher, on the other hand, has an additional input, namely a tweak T, which is a public value and um, which adds some flexibility to the cipher and it does some yeah, internal uh, randomization. And this means if you have uh, fixed inputs, but you have different tweaks, then you also get uh, different uh, cipher texts as an output. Another important concept that we will uh, encounter in this talk is about authenticated encryption. And what it does is it takes uh, an associated data block, a message, and a secret key in a nonce as input and produces a cipher text in a tag. And the ciphertext is the encryption of the message M, and the tag protects the authenticity and integrity of the associated data and uh, the message. And the nonce here, so denoted by N, uh, has, a similar, uh, has a similar functionality as a, as a tweak in a tweakable block cipher, namely it randomizes uh, the, the scheme. So how are these two things, how can we put them together? I will show you this on the example of uh, the OCB block cipher, which, uh, and in particular by the whole family of OCB block ciphers, which was introduced by Rockaway. And um, so as you can see here, uh, when you look at this first block here, this is basically a tweakable block cipher, and the nonce here is the value n and uh, the tweak, sorry, is the value n, uh, the nonce, and a value t, a1, which here depends on the concrete, uh, on, the, on the position of the input block. So that means, in particular, each input block here is transformed with a different tweak. Um, and since we do this very often, we, of course, want that the change of the tweak is uh, very efficient. Um, tweakable block ciphers have already quite uh, a history. Uh, it started all in 1998 uh, when ciphers held still funny names like hasty putting cipher. And uh, it was an AES submission and it was the first uh, tweakable block cipher. I put this in parentheses here because the cipher uh, didn't manage to get uh, over the first round because there were some flaws in it. But nevertheless, uh, it introduced uh, this concept of tweakable block ciphers. And then there is a, a whole history, so that's not the full history of trickle block ciphers. I just took some, some uh, interesting points. For example, Mercy was a trickle block cipher for disk encryption. Then there is the, the three fish block cipher, which was used in the SHA-3 uh, finalist scan. And then there is more recently in 2014, there was the tweak key framework introduced, uh, which is then used in CISA submissions like Deoxys Yoltik and Kiasso. So our focus in this talk is we will uh, look at generic tweakable block cipher design. And when we started out working on this, we asked ourselves, okay, what is, what is the simplest approach that you can uh, realize such a tweakable block cipher? And what you in fact do is <coughs> you take your existing block cipher and you somehow generate a tweak-based mask and you add the mask before and after the call of your block cipher. Um, you can, of course, also use a public permutation. Um, so you have here in the middle, you don't have the, the keyed block cipher, but a public permutation, and you do, you do it in a similar way, but you have to take care here that your tweak now also depends on the secret key, otherwise you don't have any key material uh, at all here. 
So usually the block cipher based approaches are uh, done with a 128 bit block because here you usually use the AES for a block for as the block cipher and in the permutation based uh, approaches they have usually much much uh, much larger uh, block si uh, sizes between 256 and 1600 when you for example think about the the Ketchak permutation so <coughs> How or what are approaches to generate uh, these masks that we add uh, before and after our block cipher? One approach is the so-called powering up masking, which was introduced in the XEX uh, construction by Rogoway in 2004. And what it, uh, the tweak is basically composed of, uh, of values alpha, beta, and gamma, and the nonce n. And what you do is you first encrypt your, your nonce using the, the block cipher, <coughs> and then you modify this base value by multiplying it by 2 to the power of alpha, 3 to the power of beta, uh, 7 to the power of gamma. And this way you can, uh, by changing the, the values alpha, beta, and gamma, you can generate new, uh, new masks. Um, this was very popular and was used in the OCB2 uh, uh, variant of the OCB block cipher family and also in, in various CSER candidates. <coughs> and later on, in 2014, there was the tweakable even Mansur construction introduced, which goes in a similar way, but is now permutation-based. And instead of having here the block cipher, uh, you, you do this construction, you uh, concatenate the key with the nonce and accelerate with the key uh, and concatenate it with the, the nonce and you apply the the permutation on it. And this was also, this is also used in, in CISA candidates like uh, MinAlpha and Prost. So let's have a concrete look at how power up masking is used in, in OCB2. So when you look here at the first block, um, then you see how the mask is constructed. Namely, you, you take this L value, which is your encrypted nonce, and then you multiply it by 2 to the power of 1 times 3 to the power of 2. And when you go to the next block, you just multiply it by two. And you continue until you uh, process all of your associated data blocks. And you, two, you do over here the same thing. But you, as you can see here, this three to the power of two is missing. Uh, that's for the domain separation of the different masks so that you don't have here any mask collisions and uh, use, for example, a mask twice to, uh, to mask different blocks. So when you're done with encryption, you go back and uh, you compute here the checksum of the message blocks and <coughs> uh, yeah, have again a unique mask, 2 to the power of m times 3 times l uh, that you use for this uh, mask of the message blocks. Um, and when you look at this, um, the, mask, uh, the masking update can in fact be done very uh, efficiently, namely it's just a shift and an XOR. But what you have to take care about when you implement this is that this XOR is conditional. So this means because you're computing all of this over finite uh, of over Galois fields, um, you you also have to once in a while uh, do a, a, redu a reduction with respect to a polynomial, and this might introduce when you don't take care uh, about it or if you're not very careful. Uh, then you might introduce some timing uh, leaks uh, in your block cipher construction. And also on certain platforms this might, for example on, on, on smaller, smaller platforms, this might get quite uh, expensive to implement. Then there is another approach which is word-based power up masking which was introduced by Chakraborty and Sarkar in 2006. Here again the tweak is uh, a tuple i and the, and the nonce n. Uh, and what you do here is you basically you construct uh, a tower of fields where this set value is not now uh, a value over f2, but in fact a value from f to the power of uh, f2 to the power of, of w. Um, so this is a little bit more software friendly since you're doing now a word-based approach instead of a bitwise approach, but still it has similar drawbacks as the regular power-up approach uh, with respect to this uh, timing leak. A last approach is uh, gray code masking where, yeah, as the name says, you use a gray code 
um, to construct this masking, and it is used in variants OCB1 and 3. And again, here, uh, for updating the mask, what you basically only have to do is uh, you need a single XOR, provided that you did some pre-computations before. If you are not doing this, then you need up to uh, log 2i field doublings to, to update this mask. And again, this might introduce uh, timing, timing leaks when you are not careful about uh, how you implement this. Um, however, uh, as Rogaway uh, and Provet showed in 2011, this is uh, more efficient uh, than the powering up approach, and that's also why it's used in the latest variant of OCB. So our comp contributions are now uh, a new tweakable block cipher constructions uh, that we call the masked even Mansur construction, which uh, uses an improved masking approach. And uh, the nice thing about this is that an implementer, he does not need to know anything about uh, finite field arithmetic whatsoever. Uh, it is much more efficient than the, the previous approaches and by default, it's also constant time. So when you implement just the, the basic versions, it's by default constant time. And um, it what's quite uh, nice about this is that I, I talked about uh, the domain separation before. And to do this in our setting here, you need some discrete logarithm computations uh, over, over big finite fields. And uh, also some applications to, uh, I promised you some applications to authenticated encryption, and I will show you two schemes. One is uh, a non-respecting uh, authentic authenticated encryption schemes, which runs in 0 0.55 cycles per byte, and one misuse-resistant variant, which uh, runs in 1.06 cycles per byte. So how does this constriction concretely look like? Um, we, our tweak is again, uh, composed of uh, four values, alpha, beta, gamma, and the nonce. And what we do is we use our permutation here to, to get a base value by concatenating the nonce n with the key and uh, applying the permutation on it. And afterwards, we have some LFSRs here, uh, 0, uh, phi 0, phi 1, and phi 2. And they operate on this base value, and by this we can generate new masks. Um, and this combines basically the uh, advantages of this powering up masking that I showed you before and word-based uh, LFSRs. And as I said, it's, it's very simple because you basically, you only, what you do is you evaluate your permutation once and then you only do uh, LFSR-based updates of your mask and you don't need any uh, Galois field arithmetic whatsoever. It's also very efficient as I will show you later on and uh, as I said, it's also constant time. Um, so what, when, we are, when we were starting with this work, we were particularly interested in getting an efficient masking schemes for, for, large, uh, for large states. And we also wanted to keep the, the amount of operations that you need to do this update very low so that we can uh, get something very efficient. And here I took some, uh, some, value, some LFSRs that we found with, uh, with our approach. And for example, so what, what does this table mean? We, have, we operate on a state size of uh, B bits, which is uh, separated in N words of W bits. And for example, here in the, when you, when you look at the first row here, this is a 128 bit state, and uh, it is separated in 16 words, uh, where each has uh, one byte. So, uh, this is very suitable, for example, for masking AES-based uh, block ciphers. And uh, I also want to sh uh, show you this last uh, uh, LFS, this red, redly highlighted LFSR here, which uh, is over 1024 bits, and it's based on 64-bit words uh, uh, and 16 of them. So, and what you basically do is you you take your 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 array of 16 of 16 words. You shift it by one to the left, and then you update uh, your last word uh, by this, by this uh, instruction sequence. And as you can see, it takes only uh, one bit rotation, an XOR, and a bit shift. And as you 
uh, might imagine, since uh, ARX primitives, uh, so efficient uh, versions of ARX primitives are usually implemented in a word sliced way, this is very suitable for applying them to ARX primitives. And I will also show you uh, in a moment uh, why this is the case. <coughs> so one, one thing that you uh, have to think about, however, is okay, how do we get this domain separation when I'm applying different LFSRs on a base value? How do I ensure that the different values do not collide? And intuitively, when you have two different values, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, and alpha prime, beta prime, gamma prime, then you want to make sure that the evaluation uh, of the LFSRs on your base state is on both sides uh, different. So the challenge here is, how to set the proper domain for, for this alpha, beta, and gamma, and that's where the discrete logarithms basically come into play. So let's have a look here uh, what, what has been done and what, what we did. Um, in 2004, Rogaway showed for uh, 64 uh, up to 128 bits how to do this masking. Then uh, some ciphers uh, used results uh, between 256 and 512 um, implicitly, such as, as Prist. And what we did here is we solved uh, this whole range here uh, to be able to do this uh, domain separation for the masking schemes. And of course, uh, this is not, not the end. Uh, this 1024, this uh, recent breakthrough, uh, breakthroughs in uh, discrete logarithm computations over finite fields can be, of course, done over much higher values, so it's also no problem to do 2 to the power of 11, 2 to the power of 12, and 2 to the power of 13. But for uh, cipher design, it was not that relevant, or at least for our case here, it was not that relevant. But you can still, uh, you could still do it. So to give you an intuition, for example, for the 1024 case, uh, what you do is, um, so if you remember uh, the TLS talk from today in the morning, that you have a huge amount of pre-computation that you have to do. And in our case here, this took uh, about uh, 33 hours or something, if I remember correctly, to do this uh, pre-computation. And then to compute concrete uh, discrete logarithms, you needed, I think, I think the overall time was around 50 hours on a very normal uh, uh, desktop machine. So some implementation results of our, of our masking scheme here. Um, this table is, shows uh, the cycles per uh, mask update. So and when you, for example, take the Haswell architecture, the power up masking uh, takes 10 cycles per update for a 1024-bit state. Uh, gray code masking takes 3.6 uh, cycles per update. And our approach takes uh, roughly 2.7. So, but you have to take this with a, with a grain of salt because when you plug then in the masking into a concrete construction, then of course these performance numbers are somewhat hidden by the, by the block cipher or by the permutation because it's usually much more costly to evaluate that uh, in comparison to the masking. So to the applications to authenticated encryption, the first one is uh, the offset public permutation mode, which is a, a uh, has security against non-respecting adversaries. And what it does is here you have an, an authentication part which processes the associated data and the checksum of the message. And as you can see here, for example, this first block uh, applies phi to the power of zero, uh, phi, okay. uh, phi to the power of zero uh, to the space mask L. And then you update your, your, your your base uh, value with the LFSRs and continue. And then to do the do domain separation here, as you can see, you just uh, uh, do a different LFSR operation, phi one uh, squared, where this phi one is basically phi uh, XORed with the ID. And you also have for, for the encryption uh, part here, you have also something similar. Okay, then MRO is uh, the misuse resistant variant which uh, has here uh, the, the authentication part, and it uh, also has a very similar approach to do this domain separation. And then you compute uh, the authentication tag and use that uh, as a seed to uh, seed your uh, CTR mode for encryption. And 
to give you some more uh, details about the implementation, what we did is here we uh, went with the 1024-bit uh, state and the LFSR that I showed you before. And for the permutation, we used the one from Blake to B with four or six rounds. And what you end up with is uh, for the nonce respecting uh, cipher, uh, you, for example, when you go to a Haswell, it runs in 0 0.55 cycles per byte. Uh, or when you go a little bit uh, higher in the round numbers, then you end up with 0 0.75. And what's also nice here is in comparison to the AES-based uh, variants, it ho has also very good performance numbers on ARM architectures. A similar picture is here for the misuse resistant variant, where you basically, on Haswell, you get values around one cycle per byte or 1.4 for the six-round variant. So when you translate this to throughput, then we end up uh, basically with OPP with uh, around 6.36 uh, gigabytes per second on the Haswell architecture, and for MRO with uh, uh, roughly 3.3 .3 gigabytes per second. So my second last slide here is I want to show you why this is very, very nice for, from an implementation point of view. So when you start your LFSR here with the 16 words, um, what you do is, for the first update, you take x, uh, x0 and x5 and compute this x16 word uh, through the update of your LFSR. Then for the next step, you use x1 and x6. For the next step, you use x2 and x7. And for the last step, you use x3 and x8. Um, and as you can see, since they depend on different words, you can parallelize this very, very well. And in addition, what's very nice is with four additional words of storage, you can keep four uh, complete masks in, uh, in your memory. So, and as I said, since ARX primitives are usually to get them uh, for with good performance, you usually do uh, word slicing, and this is, of course, uh, very nice to, to go together with, with these primitives. So, as a conclusion, what I showed you is the mask even Mansur construction. Uh, which is very simple, efficient, and constant time. Um, the domain separation was uh, justified by these breakthroughs in discrete logarithm computation, and I also showed you two uh, schemes uh, for authenticated encryption, which has very, very nice uh, performance numbers. Um, for more information, you can go to the, to the ePrint archive, which has the full version with all the security proofs. And you find on GitHub all the implementation with uh, C reference code and also the optimized versions for AVIX, AVIX2, and uh, Neon Extraction. Okay, that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Philip. <coughs> Any quick question? Yeah. So the, the, the question is, what what's happen if n is equal to zero, right? When what is uh, n? L. L. Ah, L. Ah, yeah. So if you feed your LFSR of with course. zeros, yeah, yeah. Then uh, so you All have the to. Are equal. Of course, when you uh, when you really want to instantiate this, then you have to make sure that your state in the beginning is not completely zero. So you have to put in some constant values in the beginning. Uh, that's what I what I left out here. Because otherwise, you would just, with your LFSRs, you would just update uh, all the time uh, the value zero. And then you always have the constant zero masking. So you want to prevent that somehow. Any other question? No, so it's time to for coffee break. So let's yeah. thank Philip okay. again. Thanks. Thanks.